Not many people remember the original Spider-Man movies, and we're not talking about the Tobey Maguire films. This forgotten trilogy from the 1970s played in theaters worldwide, marking a curious debut for the web-slinger on the silver screen. Let's break down the original live-action Spider-Man movies you probably never saw. These three Spider-Man movies weren't originally supposed to be movies. In fact, all three hail from the live-action TV show The Amazing Spider-Man that aired on CBS. Part of a wave of live-action superhero TV shows in the late 70s that delivered the likes of The Incredible Hulk and Wonder Woman, The Amazing Spider-Man aired from 1977 to 1979. The feature-length pilot that kicked off this trilogy also served as a movie entitled Spider-Man, the first entry in this trilogy of Spider-Man movies. The subsequent two installments of the trilogy, Spider-Man Strikes Back and Spider-Man The Dragon's Challenge, were each comprised of two other episodes of The Amazing Spider-Man Show. Headlining all three movies is Nicholas Hammond as Peter Parker while Robert F. Simon portrays J. Jonah Jameson in each entry of the trilogy. Beyond them, each movie is primarily stocked up with a whole new cast. Whereas modern Spider-Man movies obviously get massive global theatrical releases, the original Spider-Man trilogy had a much more limited theatrical reach. Domestically, audiences only saw these episodes as part of Spider-Man's brief stint on the airwaves. In certain international territories, though, these episodes were repackaged as a trilogy of movies distributed by Columbia Pictures, who would go on to be the distributor of the modern Spider-Man movies in the 21st century. Peter Parker's debut live-action movie follows a plot familiar to anyone who's seen Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield's first takes on Spider-Man. Nicholas Hammond's debut as Spider-Man begins with the superhero's alter ego, Peter Parker, getting bitten by a radioactive spider. Soon after, he discovers that he's been bestowed with extraordinary superpowers like being able to crawl up walls. Future incarnations of this storyline would see Parker facing off against Green Goblin and the Lizard. For this pilot, Spidey would go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Edward Byron, a guru who's hypnotizing New Yorkers to commit crimes. Clumsy fight scenes involving Byron's henchmen and an assortment of near-death experiences involving hypnosis ensue, as Spider-Man does his best to stop Byron. Unlike the other two entries in this series, the 1977 Spider-Man was always intended to be a feature-length story. In this era, it was a common practice for TV pilots to run this long, as was giving these projects international theatrical releases. Going down this route allowed the producers of pilots like Spider-Man to have their cake and eat it too, hedging their bets on both the domestic TV market and the international theatrical circuit. Official box office figures for Spider-Man 77 have never been released, but the book Age of TV Heroes, the live-action adventure of your favorite comic book characters by Jason Hofius and George Corey claims a production earned $9 million in overseas grosses. Whereas the 1977 Spider-Man movie dealt with villainy related to hypnosis, the sequel, Spider-Man Strikes Back, is all about nuclear warfare. The topic is explored through Spider-Man's confrontation with a villain by the name of Mr. White. No, not that Mr. White. And no, not that one either. Spidey's newest foe hatches a devious plan that involves bombing the World Trade Center. Much like the infamous finale of the 1976 King Kong, also set on the Twin Towers, Mr. White's evil plan makes watching Spider-Man Strikes Back in 2020 a far more uncomfortable experience than one would expect from a live-action Spider-Man movie. Thankfully, this isn't the only scheme Mr. White has concocted, because this is two standalone episodes stitched together into a movie. Mr. White eventually moves on from nuclear weapons to an assassination attempt on the President of the United States. I think I may have to uh, try a new approach with this piece of merchandise. The film eventually ends with Mr. White escaping and promising to get his revenge on Spider Man. Given that Mr. White never appeared again, this was a promise he couldn't keep, which, as Spider Man knows, is the best kind of promise. Whereas the previous Spider Man movie got a general theatrical release internationally, Spider Man Strikes Back was given a far more restrained theatrical launch. Only a handful of European territories, including Germany, screened the title. Its overseas theatrical presence was so minimal that there are no recorded box office figures for the project. Much like Mr. White leaving the scene of a dastardly crime, Spider Man Strikes Back vanished some theaters without a trace. But the one thing they love more than a hero is to see a hero fail. Wrapping up the trilogy was Spider-Man The Dragon's Challenge, which saw the web crawler facing off against a villain named Zyter, a wealthy man who wants to kill an old colleague of J. Jonah Jameson by the name of Min Lo Chan. 
With incriminating information on Zaita in his possession, Min Lo Chan's life is in constant danger. The only person who could possibly protect Lo Chan and his niece Emily from these threats is Spider-Man. Thus, the web crawler ends up protecting Min from the various bruises Zaita sends to assassinate him. Eventually, Peter Parker uses his wits to expose Zaita and his treachery, thus preserving the life of Min Lo Chan. Like Spider-Man Strikes Back, the Dragon's Challenge received a minor theatrical release in international territories, with this particular entry screening in countries such as Australia. Also like its predecessor, The Dragon's Challenge has never reported box office figures for its theatrical run. This means that the largest legacy of this project is two members of its supporting cast. Firstly, there was Rosalind Chow, who played Emily in the movie. She scored an early acting credit here before going on to appear in numerous TV shows and movies, including Star Trek Deep Space Nine. She's also reportedly part of the cast of the upcoming Marvel Studios movie Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. Also appearing in Spider-Man The Dragon's Challenge in the role of Major Collins was Ted Danson. When the episodes comprising this movie originally aired in 1978, Collins served as Danson's third credited appearance as an actor. In many movie trilogies, it's easy to discern at least some kind of overarching story. Some of those three movie arcs can be loose, like the Sam Raimi Spider-Man trilogy and its payoffs relating to Sandman, Uncle Ben, Harry Osborn, and the Green Goblin. Other trilogies, like The Lord of the Rings, are so tightly wound together that it's more or less not possible to comfortably jump in at the middle of the story. That's not the case with this inaugural Spider-Man trilogy, for the simple reason that they were never meant to be an interconnected series of films to begin with. There's a sense of disconnect across the three movies movies that makes it unique among movie trilogies, particularly ones starring superheroes. The original 1977 Spider-Man is a standalone feature-length pilot meant to introduce viewers to the idea of weekly Spider-Man adventures rather than set up feature-length sequels. As for the two follow-ups, there are each just multiple episodes of that TV show that have been roughly jammed together. This explains why Spider-Man Strikes Back, for example, stops and starts its plot for two wildly different evil plans from Mr. White. Each plan was originally the same of its own TV episode, rather than two halves of a movie. This results in very little storytelling cohesion across these Spider-Man features as individual properties, let alone across the ramshackle trilogy as a whole. With the exception of J. Jonah Jameson, Spidey's supporting cast in these movies is almost entirely composed of new characters who have nothing to do with the Spider-Man comics. Who is that character anyway? For instance, in the first Spider-Man movie, a character named Judy Tyler is the most prominent woman in Peter Parker's life, instead of Gwen Stacy or Mary Jane Watson. Spider-Man's best friend Harry Osborn is also absent from all three features. The presence of new characters is especially notable when it comes to the trilogy's villains. Instead of facing off against seminal foes like Green Goblin or Kraven the Hunter, international moviegoers retreated to the site of Spidey waging war against Edward Byron and Mr. White. None of the oversized figures in colorful for costumes that usually pick a fight with Spider-Man would be found here. The lack of Spidey's iconic supporting cast and foes from the comics explain a lot as to why these movies didn't win over comic book devotees. They also reinforce how these three movies are such strange outliers in Spider-Man's feature film career. Opinions differ about the quality of the 21st century Spider-Man movies, but one thing is clear. All of them garnered better marks than the original three Spider-Man movies. A retrospective review of the 1977 Spider-Man movie from Joe Blow described the project as goofy, cheesy, and penny-pinching a critique that can be applied to every movie in the series. Criticism of the low budgets are common. Though presented theatrically overseas, the TV origins of these Spider-Man movies was readily apparent on the screen. Reviews for the follow-ups didn't get any better. Spider-Man Strikes Back was reviled by the Dissolve for many reasons, with one observation being that Spider-Man doesn't throw his first punch until the film is half over. Meanwhile, the conclusion of the trilogy Spider-Man The Dragon's Challenge was declared by Inverse to be the worst Spider-Man movie ever made, due to the film's over overwhelmingly tedious nature. While each of the individual films drew their own unique criticisms, the critical reception to the first trilogy of Spider-Man movies was subpar across the board. Worst of all, though, was that Spider-Man co-creator Stan Lee was critical of the TV show that spawned these three movies. Echoing modern complaints about the lack of personality in this original Spider-Man trilogy, Lee once said of the show, They left out the humor. They left out the human interest and personality and playing up characterizations and personal problems. 
Usually, anything with the Spider-Man logo is guaranteed to get some form of release, but there are limits to everything, and even the lucrative nature of the character hasn't guaranteed new home video releases for these three movies. Though put out on VHS in the 1980s, the original live-action Spider-Man trilogy hasn't found its way into any other home media format since. This mirrors the scarcity of the Amazing Spider-Man TV show as a whole, which has been entirely denied a proper home video release, save for a handful of episodes making their way onto VHS. By contrast, the Spider-Man show from Japan, released in the same era as The Amazing Spider-Man, has managed to get released on physical home media in Region 2 markets. The age of streaming has offered no salvation for the increase availability of these original three Spider-Man movies. They have never appeared on any streaming platform, and no plans have been announced to have them stream alongside other Spider-Man programming on a platform like Disney+. The negative reception associated with the program, as well as a lack of a major fan base to champion for its release, has led to these three Spider-Man movies gathering dust on a shelf somewhere in a corporate vault. While comic books are the go-to source of creative inspiration for adaptations of Marvel Comics characters, certain TV shows like The Incredible Hulk have managed to leave a lasting creative legacy. Such was not the case with this trilogy of Spider-Man movies. Much like the TV show they spun off from, these Spider-Man films have mostly vanished from the pop culture consciousness. Do us both a favor. Forget it! Part of that is due to the trilogy's reliance on a down-to-earth vision of Spider-Man. The lack of exciting or strange elements in these films has kept them from turning into a cult hit, like the 1970s Japanese Spider-Man show. The lack of a proper home video or streaming release has similarly ensured that the first three Spider-Man movies have become a pop culture footnote. In other ways, the property's longevity has been hurt by how it hasn't been referenced in other Spider-Man media, rarely being treated as a real adaptation of the Spider-Man story. One exception to this phenomenon came in the 2019 edition of Entertainment Weekly's The Ultimate Guide to the Avengers, which recognized Nicholas Hammond as one of the four actors to have portrayed Spider-Man in live action. It was a rare moment of recognition for the actor that first took the web crawler to the movies. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more Luba videos about Spider-Man and his amazing friends are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.